What's up, Church Online community? My name is Caleb, and I am so excited about today's online experience. As you're jumping on live, we want to hear from you. Send us a wave or drop an emoji in the comments to let us know you're here. Before we get started, we wanted to give you some tips for a better online experience. Number one, don't watch. That's right, we don't want you to watch this service. We want you to join this service. No matter who you are or where you're from, we believe God brought you here for a reason, and we want you to be part of creating and contributing to this online experience. Number two, minimize distractions. It's really easy to get distracted, whether it's someone walking outside, a notification on your phone, or one of your kids jumping on you. Do your best to minimize distractions because we believe that when we remove distractions, it allows our minds to focus on God and hear what His Spirit wants to say to our hearts. Number three, ask questions and take your next step. If you have questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the comments. We believe in next steps and we know that one small step toward God can change our lives forever. Maybe you wanna join a group, get involved serving, or make a decision to follow Jesus. No matter what your next step is, one of our chat hosts would love to connect with you and help you take that step. As we begin the service, focus your mind and heart on drawing near to God. Remember, it's never just another Sunday, never just another church service. We have the opportunity right now to allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts and change us from the inside out. Are you ready? Let's go. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing Nothing is better 
to hear stories of how God is using this ministry to change lives. If this church has impacted your life, then share your story. Reach out to us on our website or message us on social media and let us know what God is doing. And a huge shout out to those of you who are partnering with us through online giving and recurring giving. Giving changes lives and you are making a difference every single day. If you would like to get started with online giving, simply click the link to partner with what God is doing through this church to change the world around us. Welcome, Family Harvest Church. My name is Thomas Wiggins, your guest speaker this week. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. I am one of your teaching leaders here at Family Harvest Church Celebrate Recovery on Thursday nights. So before we get started, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the blessings we've received. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And just thank you for this time that we get to spend together. Um, hearing a word from you lord get me out of the way and let your word come through me in jesus name we pray amen so first and foremost i'd like to thank god for opening this door and allowing me to step into all that he has for me i'd like to thank pastor Wynn for the opportunity he presented me with to preach the word of god and for my beautiful wife haley for being by my side and encouraging me through this journey and for my family and friends who made it here for their support. Out of respect for Pastor Wynn, I lo would love to, for everyone to follow his guidelines when it comes to worship through sermon. Number one, listen for yourself. Don't go nudging your neighbor and telling them this word's for you when this word is for you. Don't listen through the lens of your past. Um, God won't change it. All you can do is learn from it. And three, listen with a humble heart. You are free to shout praises anytime during the sermon. And if you have complaints, you are free to email Pastor Wynn at, after the service as well. So quick overview. Over the next four weeks, we're going to dive into the book of Colossians, chapter by chapter, to find the answers to the question, what is complicating your relationship with Jesus? For me to be transparent and honest with you, I'll go ahead and give you the answer to that question, and it's me. My thoughts, habits, reactions to situations and circumstances, pride and selfishness all get in the way of my relationship with Jesus Christ. My prayer is that through this message and throughout the entire series, God would highlight those areas in my life and do the same for you. Empower us by grace to do a moral and honest assessment of ourselves and bring us to true repentance so that we can take off the things that complicate our relationship with Christ. And we're going to do it as easy as the title of the whole series, Less is More. Subtitle for this message that covers chapter one of Colossians, Who Ordered the Supreme? So like always, before we eat and have our fill, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time together. Let your word speak clearly and penetrate our hearts. Clear your house from all distractions and fill this place with your presence so that we get a little taste of glory, the little taste of the glory that is to come. Like the prophet Jeremiah, 
Let us devour your words so that they become the joy in our heart's delight. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. So let me ask you, what's the foundation of a pizza? The dough, bread, bread of life, Jesus. So a cool trick I learned about answering questions in church is Jesus is the answer to most questions, including this one about pizza. So when you think of a supreme pizza, you're thinking of all the toppings, pepperoni, sausage, green peppers, onions, black olives, anchovies. Ugh. See, Jesus had a thing about bread and fish, but that's a whole other series. Now, as a Christian, I want you to imagine your life as a supreme pizza. You believe Jesus is who he says he is. You've accepted his finished work on the cross and he is your foundation but yet we tend to add toppings like trying harder behavior modification legalism and keeping the law beating yourself up when you fail to do those things and that's just my list i want you complicated uh, contemplating on your list of toppings for a second and now i'll offer you some hope ecclesiastes 1 9 there is nothing new under the sun See, around 60 AD, the Apostle Paul wrote the letter of Colossians to the church in Colossae, trying to combat those false teachings because the Christians there were adding to the truth of Christ. Syncretism was a problem. Their faith was built on Jesus Christ, but when they started combining, but then they started combining other religious practices and philosophies, adding to their foundation and combining and complicating their lives just like we do today. During this time in history, you had Roman gods and goddesses, and remind you, Rome had ruled from England to India. Greek mythology had already been fully developed for about a thousand years. And I like the illustration Pastor Matt Chandler uses to describe this scenario. Let's say you're a Colossian believer in Jesus, and you have this uh, neighbor that's a Jewish mystic who really knows how to pray. So you take a little bit of that and put it on top of your Jesus. And your other neighbor is a pagan druid. And there's some weird things that happen with animals at night. But man, does that guy really love his wife. So I want to take a little bit of that and put it on top of my Jesus as well. And on top of syncretism... Paul's also trying to combat a hearsay, which is similar to Gnosticism, emphasizing special or secret knowledge it took to be accepted by God, and that Christ alone was not the way to salvation. Mirror that to today's world, and not much has changed. We as Christians have overcomplicated Christianity with tradition, non-tradition, mixing in New Age ideology like yoga and meditation, uh, political correctness, trying to make God fit in our box, when in reality, less is more. Now, real quick, I just want to side note on the yoga and meditation. Neither one of those are bad in themselves. Um, yoga is great to stretch your body out, but instead of uh, you using it to find peace, in here is peace. In meditation, well, God's word tells you to meditate on God's word, on scripture, because it's about filling yourself with God's truth, not emptying yourself. So let me set the stage with a little more context on Colossians. Read scripture, unpack it as we go, and backing it up with more scripture so that we see that God's word really teaches itself. And then everyone can head to your favorite pizza joint since now I've made everyone hungry. As we learn by the greeting in the first verse, the Apostle Paul is the author of the letter to the people in Colossae, which was a city in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, located about 100 miles east of Ephesus and about 10 miles southeast of Laodicea. I only mentioned those two cities because there's really cool letters written to those churches in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. 
The book of Colossians, along with Philippians, Ephesians, and Philemon, are known as prison letters. That is important to know because as Christians, we sometimes believe following Jesus is easy and supposed to make us comfortable. But if you read about Paul's life, who wrote nearly half the books of the New Testament, it was hardly that. Yet, he still allowed God to use him and strengthen him through all circumstances, storms, shipwrecks, snake bites, prison sentences. And get this, he even joyfully thanked God for it because of the patience and the endurance it added to his faith. So if you had any toppings that you were just contemplating a short while ago, then in a way you're stuck in a prison as well. Let's let the word of God through Paul lead us to freedom. Now I'm mostly reading from the NIV. If that's a problem, maybe you should take that topping off your pizza. (laughs) I'm kidding. Maybe. So verse 3 and 4. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of you, of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love you have for all God's people. Look at Paul, look at who Paul is thanking. He is thanking God, not the Colossians, for their faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is defined as a gift of divine strength or ability to believe in God for unseen supernatural results in every area of life. Hebrews 11.1 Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance for, for what we do not see. By faith being a gift of the Spirit, as 1 Corinthians 12.9 says, to another faith by the same Spirit, It has to be given by God, and in this case, received by the Colossians. In today's world, us as believers. And the evidence of your faith will be shown through the action of love you have for all God's people. Key word at the end of that verse being all. Not just the people who walk, talk, and act like you, look like you, believe like you, or have the same political stance as you. I feel Jesus challenging us, me included, to take that topping off of our pizza and it will help uncomplicate our relationship with him. Amen? Verses five and six. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Paul is commending the people of Colossae for their faith and love that spring from the hope, which sounds familiar considering five years earlier, he wrote his first letter to the church in Corinth saying three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Those three things are the main emphasis of Christianity and a byproduct of trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've already defined faith. Now hope is the attitude and focus of what is stored up for you in heaven. And love is action. James 2, 17, in the same way, faith itself if it is not accompanied with action, is dead. You see, love is the action that coincides with faith that produces fruit. And Jesus proves that in John 13, 15, by, uh, sorry, 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So let me reel all this back into the text. Paul is encouragingly reminding them that they already understand God's grace through the gospel that is bearing fruit because of their faith, love, and hope they are growing in. So how is the gospel bearing fruit in your life? Since we're talking about fruit, how many people like pineapple on their pizza? Well, here's my first point, and we'll just call it the pineapple point. 
Faith is a gift from the Father to empower us to carry the fruit further. In the words of the great theologian Kevin Hart, you're going to learn today. So I'm sorry. Pray for me because I am not fully matured yet. <laughs> and do not look at the context of that. I'll clarify that point, though, just so no one blames God for the reason they don't have faith. You have to have an open heart to believe in him. Accept his free gift of grace. And then he will empower you by his spirit to grow your faith that will transform you from the inside and want to carry the gospel to others. Jesus wants you to tell people about him and he gives you the power. Just trust him. Have faith in him. It only takes a mustard seed size of faith and he'll do the growing. So let's go down to verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. All right, Paul says we ask God to fill you, implying that you're not already full. Hence, that's what the process of sanctification is. The Spirit is filling you to live out your faith and good deeds with love. It's not going to be perfect, but it should be progressing. Just because we're not fully sanctified, however, does not mean that we're not fully 100% justified, though. When God sees us, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ in you, not the mistakes and the sin. Watch this concept play out in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. We can only see what the Spirit fills us with now. Then we shall see face to face. We won't be full until we see Christ face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. God only fills you with enough for each day but he already sees you as a finished product. Which brings us to my second point, the one slice too many point. Receiving God's fullness is the answer to your spiritual dullness. A piece of advice, if you want to know what God's will is, read your Bible. It's the primary way you'll find out what God wants for you. You can't know God and his will knowledge or wisdom without seeking it. God will do for you what you can't do for you, but he will not do for you what you can do for yourself. Verses 10 through 14, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, Paul circling back around to a few things that he's already touched on here, but he's also starts exposing the hearsay that's similar to Gnosticism. Gnosis is Greek for knowledge. Gnostics valued the accumulation of knowledge and believed that the special knowledge it took to get close to God would be hidden from most believers. But notice how Paul is refuting this. He's not attacking it head on with the Gnostics themselves, debating to win an argument, pointing out that you're wrong and that I'm right, He's not playing the denomination versus denomination or religion versus religion game. Paul is confident in the truth of Jesus Christ, and he should be because he himself was transformed into a new creation just like you and I, the people of Colossae, and everyone who believes in the gospel. Paraphrasing Paul here, but if it's knowledge you want, I'll just keep praying that God fills you with the knowledge of his will 
so that everything you do, whether in word or deed, it will all bring glory back to God. Knowledge of God is not a secret. It's open to everyone, and it's not what you know, but who you know. Knowing Christ is knowing God. Paul reminds us, them, we're all the same at this point, to give joyful thanks to the Father, and then he lists five pretty good reasons why. One, he qualified us to share in the inheritance. You cannot qualify yourself, by the way. Two, he has rescued from the dominion, rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Living in sin is living in darkness, but you can't hide in the dark from God. Three, brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. The sun shines on darkness. Four, He redeemed us. He paid the price for our sin and judgment. And five, He forgave all of our sins. Can someone give God five seconds of praise for at least five things He's done in your life? Come on, you are the sons and daughters of the Most High God, adopted into a royal priesthood, bought with the price. By the precious blood of Jesus Christ, light of the world that darkness cannot can no longer overtake. And when Satan comes accusing, all you have to do is say, get behind me for I am redeemed. Thank you, Father. Come on. Pizza is always better when you have coupons to redeem. So my third point, the coupon point is we've been rescued from rebellion. So our conduct should reflect our redeemer. As followers of Christ, the world should notice something different about us, how we walk, talk, and carry ourselves that intrigues them, draws them in to ask questions so that we can point them to the answer, Jesus Christ. Moving on to verses 15 through 22. Now, here's where Paul's letter makes the title of the message makes sense because verses 15 through 22 is all about the supremacy of Christ. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Simply put, Jesus is God in human form. He is the exact representation of God. Jesus himself tells us multiple times in the gospel, and one of those times is in John 10:30. I and the Father are one. It doesn't get any plainer than that. Because Jesus is unique and holy, perfect and without sin, he, when he speaks, he speaks absolute truth. We must believe in the deity of Jesus Christ or our Christian faith is shallow and pointless. And without Christ being who he said he is, we have no hope and no redemption. So let's move on before someone's oven overheats. The firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. What Paul is showing us here is that Jesus is and has always been eternal. Being the firstborn over all creation does not mean that Jesus was created, but the opposite. Before anything else, Jesus was. Jesus was in the beginning, and he is the creator of heaven and earth. Paul is refuting all kinds of misconceptions of Christ, like if matter is evil, then God wouldn't come to earth as a human, yet Paul points out that Jesus is the exact image of God and died a human death on a cross. Some believed God didn't create the world, and that's a big one today, because God is good and wouldn't create evil. Yet Paul contends that Jesus is God in the flesh, creator of the physical world, meaning he has power over storms, disease, and death, and the spiritual world over angels and demons. He is over all powers, rulers, and authorities. The people in our political office that you may or may not like, God has authority over them, and they are there because God wants it that way. And get this, 
whether you or I think they're good or evil, God will use them to bring glory to himself. God uses believers to bring glory to him through love, grace, and mercy shown to the world. Non-believers will bring glory to him through his wrath and justice. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Multiple Proverbs say that, and the opposite of wisdom is foolishness. So I pray that we all start having a healthy fear of the Lord and not be a fool. All through the gospel, Jesus' power over everything is revealed, especially when it comes to the demons. They know exactly who Jesus is every time they encounter him, and they have to obey him. For example, Luke 8.28, Matthew 8.29, and Mark 5.7 all record the encounter Jesus has with the demon-possessed man with the legion of demons in him. And the demon's response to Jesus is, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Even Satan actually has to ask the Lord permission to test Job with his afflictions which shows not only Jesus' omnipotence, having supreme power, also, but also his omniscience, all-knowing, that Job would still remain faithful to God through his afflictions. Aren't you glad you have Jesus to sustain you through your afflictions? What do you need to take off your pizza that can't sustain you? Money, health, accolades, position? He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul says, Your life is being held together by Jesus. The world and all of creation is being held together by Jesus. Christ is the sustainer of life. You woke up and made it here today because of the air in your lungs. That's the breath of life from Genesis 2.7. But follow me here. If you say, no, we get oxygen from plants. Well, Genesis 1.11, Jesus created plants on the third day and sustains them with water and light, which he created on the first day, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. Now, watch how it all comes together. Jesus offers living water in John 4.10, and John calls Jesus the true light in John 1.9. So everything in the creative order not only points back to Jesus, but is still being sustained by Jesus. So in the same way, when we go to share the gospel, we must make sure that we point it all back to Jesus. He holds it all together with just his word. The son is still in the same spot since day one, being held by the word of Jesus. And he is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Being the firstborn among the dead means that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, but the first to be raised with an imperishable body, because others had been raised from the dead, either by Jesus, the prophets, or the disciples, but they eventually died again. Now, because of Christ's death and resurrection, all who trust in him will also defeat death and rise to live eternally with him. As firstborn, Jesus is exalted to the highest place of honor to have supremacy over everything. Paul gets that point across when he wrote to the Philippians, Philippians 2, 9-11, Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. One day, whether you believe or reject Jesus, in heaven, on earth, or in hell, you will still bow and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. So don't let it be too late. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, 
and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood shed on the cross. Paul keeps coming back around to Jesus being fully human and fully God to drive that point deep into our hearts. We could have a less complicated relationship with Christ if we don't diminish any aspect of Christ as well, whether it be his divinity or his humanity. Since the Mosaic Covenant, God chose to dwell among his people, whether in the tabernacle in the wilderness or later in the temple in Jerusalem. In Jesus, our unique holy God, God chose to dwell among his people as a person, to empathize with our feelings, know the everyday weaknesses that we struggle with, be tempted, yet still not sin, but remain perfect and holy so that he could make peace with us through his through a personal relationship all by the blood that he shed on the cross. God wants a covenant with you, not a contract. You can't put God in your debt by behaving or following him. Paul breaks this down in the next two verses. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Isn't it such good news that Christ became sin for us, wicked and evil people that we are, so that we can be made right with God? 15 through 22 is really the meat of this pizza and of Colossians 1 as a whole, which we could probably spend four weeks on by itself. But it leads me to my supreme point. Jesus is supreme, which makes him sufficient to sustain everything. Now, as I start to box this pizza up and send it out for delivery, I want to cover two more verses towards the end. Verse 26 and 27, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, remember, Paul is writing the letter to correct those hearsays that Christ wasn't enough and there was a secret, special, or hidden knowledge. Don't get that confused now with Paul saying that there was a mystery. The false teacher's secret plans were meant to be exclusive. God's plan was hidden only until Christ came, which was open to all people. God kept his redemptive plan hidden since the first prophecy in Genesis 3.15 through the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, which all pointed to Jesus, the coming Messiah, and he was fulfillment of them all. Thanks to the gospel, which is disclosed to the saints, people who believe it, Christ now dwells in you because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 The hope of glory that will lead you to a transformed life through Christ who gives you strength. That brings me to my last point, which comes from Louis Giglio, but I'll call it the stuff cross point. Not Christ and me, but Christ in me. You can't do it without Jesus' help. So, now that I felt God call me to end this sermon recap with an acrostic because of the impact Celebrate Recovery has had in my life, which was the path God led me down to get me here. What we learned about Jesus today is J, justification for our sins. E, eternal, always has been, he always will be. S, sustainer, holding everything together. U, unique, fancy word for holy. He is perfect and sinless. An S, supreme, over all creation. So who ordered the supreme? 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you once again for uh, the powerful word that you sent. And uh, I just pray that it uh, impacts people, Lord, and it just lands on good soil so it will sp spread 30, 60, 100 fold, Lord. Thank you for all that you do, all that you are sustaining in the supremacy of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed your time. I hope it's been a blessing. We sure enjoyed having you with us. Now, if you live here in Suffolk, Virginia, or you're going to be in the Suffolk, Virginia area, I hope you'll come and join us. For those of you that, are, are, that this ministry is blessing, right, that you're being fed weekly uh, here, I, I invite you to partner with us financially and make an investment into the mission and the vision of this ministry. You can easily give by following the prompts below. And lastly, if you haven't made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, would you make that decision today? I mean, why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next weekend when you can make that decision today? So I challenge you to pray this prayer with me. Just say these words, close your eyes, open your heart, and pray this prayer with me. Pray from your heart to his. Repeat these words. Dear God, forgive me of all my sins and mistakes. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I invite you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. My life is now in your hands. Jesus, you are my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for making that commitment. Will you just let us know uh, by clicking the link in the description of, of, of this video? Right, just, just tell us about your new decision to live for Jesus. We, we'd like to celebrate with you by, by sending you a gift. And that gift will help you walk in grace every day. Now, may God bless you. We'll see you next week. So let's all go do the great things that God has called us to as we all take one step closer to Jesus right now. I always felt guilty early on in recovery just because you hear a lot of traumatic stories. You hear a lot of like um, people getting left at places that they shouldn't be left or their, their parents put them through things that they shouldn't have been through, but that wasn't the case for me. You know, I had like the Hallmark movie upbringing. From the outside looking in, it's all perfect, you know, but I can remember vividly being a little kid just being like, you know, I'll be happy if I can just get to Christmas. And I remember Christmas coming and waking up and going under the tree, getting the Madden, getting the new outfit, getting the haircut, like getting everything that I wanted that I thought would make me happy and then sitting back like, man, may maybe it'll happen when my birthday gets here, then I'll be happy. And that's just, I just live with that feeling of emptiness and like searching to find something to, to fill what something, fill this hole, I guess. My parents divorced when I was 12 and um, things just really started to shift. That, like I would go from this perfect home life to now my dad's gone and I chose to stay with my mother. Now I'm just completely shifted from this like structured, do your chores type house to now I can just do whatever I want. I just began to um, drink every day at a young age and, and with drinking comes getting around people that are smoking weed and, and it just gradually progressed. I guess it, the changing factor in my life was um, I had a girlfriend at the time and I got her pregnant. And um, I can remember one night and, and um, I just, I just want to beat my addiction so bad, and, but I'm just hating it. And Lincoln's out of the hospital now and we've got him home and it's, I should just quit. Like, Zach, just quit. You know, you have your son here. Fight for your son, you know, fight for him. And look at all you've put him through. But um, he wakes up, it's like, it's like three o'clock in the morning and he's crying for a bottle like any two-month-old would do. and So I go to feed him, 
and, and I'm, I'm shaking so bad that I can't get the, uh, the formula to go in the bottle. It's just going all over the counter. And it, so I'm like, man, I gotta get high to feed my kid that I was just, that just was born addicted to the drugs that I'm about to put in my body. Like, what is this? So I'm sitting in his room as he cries and I'm trying to get high. And I caught a, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror that was in his room. And I've got blood coming out of my neck and out of my arms and I just can't find a vein. And I just see the 90 pound Zach. I was like, what? I was like, what am I doing? And I did what I believe believer or not is going to do in a time like that you know I cried out to my creator I was like God God please help my son you know because at the time I had accepted the fact that I'm just going to die with this needle in my arm I can't beat it so I said God just please send someone to help and be a father to Lincoln because he deserves that and I can't be that that person for him and um I know he heard my prayer I know he heard my prayer <laughs> Because within a week, I was um, caught doing everything that I was doing, living that lifestyle, and I was faced with the decision. They said, "You're gonna, you're gonna go to prison. You're gonna finish this time that that you have on this probation, or you're gonna go to a year-long treatment center called the Hope Center." So I don't really remember too much about getting there, but I'll tell you what I do remember. I do remember the next day waking up and and going through the the withdrawals hit me pretty hard and I was on like a, a gram a day heroin habit and I'm just feeling like the worst person in the world because without the drugs I'm feeling everything I've done I'm remembering I just you know for years I've been stealing from my family I just did this to my son I just did this to I just left her out you know all this stuff is just hitting me at once and I said God I hope what these people are telling me is true and I hope that you're real because I need something to change and I need it now and the next morning, I go to morning devotions, like 5.30 in the morning, and um, I open the piece of paper, and you have a book with a psalm and a proverb each day. And but I went to Psalm, and it was chapter 34, and I get down to verse 18, and it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And I don't know what it was about that scripture, but um, you know, I can put a smile on for anybody, regardless of how I feel on the inside, but at this time I felt arrested like I felt captured at this Hope Center and and it, God's word just was like no I, I rescued those whose spirits are crushed like I've rescued you and I brought you here to restore you the mother of my kid you know she was in full-blown addiction when I get out of the Hope Center and I was like oh man God like I guess this ain't the girl for me that you know I, I'm praying I'm serving you know our you know we're doing and, and God whispered to me, I will restore this relationship. I will restore this. And I was like, God, do you see her? Like, she's strung out. Like, what do you mean you'll restore her? Like, she's strung out. So she goes to treatment. And, and, and now, like, now, like, this week, I celebrated three years clean. And um, Lainey, she celebrated a year clean. You know, and we, just, we got married. And um, it's full restoration, you know. But it's all because of the Hope Center and what it did for me and, and, and how they taught me to develop my relationship with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. It is our hope that this community would be a place where we can encourage one another to be more devoted followers of Jesus Christ and to share His hope and love with the world around us. If you would like to experience the hope and love that is found in a personal relationship with Jesus, let us know by simply typing Jesus in the comments. Or maybe you're ready to get baptized, join a group, or get involved serving. No matter what your next step is, we are here to connect with you and help you pursue a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. We pray that the Holy Spirit would make the Word of God come alive to you this week and that His presence would be with you no matter where you go. We encourage you to stay up to date with this community by visiting our website or following us on any of our social media platforms. Have a great week.